Hello and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Kevin O'Malley. I'm chairman of the Business and Leadership Forum here at the club, and I'm your host for tonight. Our program tonight is Moss Spray Controversy Update, uh, partnerships between, uh, well, I can't remember all the whole name, but uh, it is all about partnerships. Uh, our moderator tonight is Christy Dames. Christy is the CEO and founder of Tech Talk Studio and also very active in helping families and children with their health care initiatives and health care challenges. Uh, I, do, I would like to ask uh, Unique Phillips to just stand up for a minute, please. And Unique is the lady over here. Uh, Unique was our co-producer on this event and has been instrumental in bringing the panel together. And I really want to thank her with a round of applause right now. Our other co-producer co is our moderator tonight, and that is Christy Dames. I'd like to introduce her right now. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. I'm really glad that you're all here. Um, we have a really incredible group of four experts, each in different fields, to talk about this issue and also to talk about not just the Elbam light brown apple moth, but also to talk about uh, pesticides and and groups of people that have come together that have are now in partnership that weren't before they didn't know that this was an issue and so we want to explore this from a couple of different vantage points and from the leadership perspective too because we have four leaders here who are doing some really important work and I like to think that where we go in California is where the rest of the country is going to have to go kind of have to make them go there so um, welcome I'm really glad you're here I got involved in this about two years ago, and I, I remember the day that I found out about it, and it was like I got a sucker punch to the head. And, and I've been helping families and children who have severe neurological illness for a long time. And I couldn't believe at that time that somebody was going to take planes, and they were going to fly over my house, and they were going to spray pesticides over me. And it, it was just incomprehensible to me that this could be. And when I see all the children that I was dealing with and working with who were already immune compromised and compromised in more ways than I could count, this was going to be that burden that could literally mean for them they may not ever recover. So I got really personally involved. I sent emails out to, to the moms and women's list that I know. And I had a, a new partnership form with a woman, and it, and it was completely, I didn't um, expect that this woman and I would become partners in this. And this is a woman who um, had, had a business, she sold her business, she has a home in Atherton, she has a home in, in San Francisco, and she just became an activist advocate like I have never seen. And I realized at that moment that do not tell a mom you're going to spray her kids. Do not do that. And this woman and I have become really good friends. But, but most importantly, I, I saw people that, that I may have thought would not take up the gauntlet to go do something and fight for something. And, and people from all over rise to an occasion, and I had not seen that. So uh, these four folks that are here with us today have very personal stories. They have uh, from the front line stories. They have stories uh, from, from way behind the line as well. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to introduce each one, and Caroline is who I'm going to start with, and she's going to give us kind of an update, actually, of where we are now, briefly. And then we're going to start into some questions and talk about the partnerships that are arising. And, uh, and then we'll welcome your questions as well. We have a mic over here, so we'll do some Q&A probably in about 35 uh, minutes or so and go from there. So I'd like to introduce first Caroline Cox. And Caroline leads the Center for Environmental Health Research on Toxic Exposures, Identifying, Analyzing, and substantiating the scientific bases for CEH's work to eliminate threats to children and others exposed to dangerous chemicals in consumer products. She also serves on the board of directors of Beyond Pesticides, and Caroline has a master's degree in entomology from Oregon State University, and I'm really happy to have you here. Caroline, could you just start by telling us from where we started on this little light brown apple moth and all the issues that have ensued, can you give us the update where we are today with, with what's actually still going on and maybe what's changed? Sure. 
So probably most of you remember, even if you haven't been following this issue in all of its twists and turns, that in the fall of 2007, the California Department of Food and Agriculture started um, what they called at that time an eradication program. Um, and they began by doing an aerial spray program in uh, Monterey and Santa Cruz. And they announced plans to expand that aerial spray program um, basically throughout the Bay Area. Um, there was a huge amount of controversy that ensued, and I, I think we'll hear more about that as, as this program proceeds. Um, eventually, uh, CDFA pretty much pulled the plug on the aerial spray part of the program. They also because of some very um, clever legal work, um, were uh, forced to do an environmental impact report about the program. And that report was actually just completed and released a couple of months ago. So we now have um, kind of a picture of, of what's being planned for the future, although the, the report can be frustratingly um, short on details. Um, but several things have happened. Uh, one is that the, um, the treatment area has expanded from the Bay Area to now it covers almost the entire state. Um, the second thing is um, after listening to um, many, 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 many people tell CDFA that eradication was impossible, that there were too many of these malls in California and they been here too long. CDFA has officially um, said that it's not an eradication program, it's a control program. And I think the important thing to know about that is that that means that there is no end. Um, it goes on forever. Um, and then uh, just to talk briefly about um, the pesticides that are included in the environmental impact report that will be um, used as this program proceeds, um, the uh, pheromones, which were used um, in the 2007 spring, um, are still um, part of the program. There's some different ways of applying them, and CDFA has said that they won't use aerial spraying technique in populated areas, although it's a little fuzzy how that's defined. Um, and the other two chemicals that seem to have kind of risen to the top in this environmental impact report are um, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is um, a bacteria that makes insects sick, and um, sp spinosad, which is um, an insecticide. Um, and um, all three of these products are things which, in one form or another, um, can be used in organic production, although not necessarily in the way that they're planned to be used um, in, the, in the apple moth program. I wanted to talk for just a couple minutes about sort of what we know about these chemicals and what we don't know. Um, well, excuse me, Carol, before we do that, can I just want to, uh, let's get back to that in one okay. second, because I would love to, to go there, but I just want to make sure everybody gets introduced first, okay. if we could do that. The second panelist I'd, I'd like to introduce is the gentleman right here who can't look at me, Roy Upton. And Roy is the uh, LBAM liaison for Citizens for Health, a citizens advocacy organization with 87,000 members nationwide. He has been involved with the LBAM since its discovery in California and has authored and or co-authored numerous scientific reviews on the human, animal, and environmental impacts of LBAM pesticide program. Roy was the lead author of a seminal scientific petition calling for the reclassification of the light brown apple moth. And Roy, what I'd, I'd like to ask you, if you could just start, what was it that stimulated your interest in this LBAM issue? Um, <clears throat> great question. It's w w very passionate for me. Um, I actually was hiking down in Elkhorn Slough. Elkhorn Slough is a uh, marine sanctuary, part of a marine sanctuary down in Santa Cruz and Aptos by uh, Watsonville. And um, I was, my real work is herbal medicine, and I was looking at plants down there. And um, right along the shore, there were about uh, 35 dead 
cormorants, and all in pristine condition. Now, usually you, when you see a roadkill or you see a dead bird, it's rotten, it's eaten by maggots or flies, and they're just all in pristine condition. I'm thinking, what the heck could have killed these birds? I didn't think twice, you know, I, I left it at that, didn't think twice about it. Then we got sprayed in Santa Cruz, and the day after we got sprayed, we got sprayed Thursday night, and Friday morning, uh, my eyes are scratchy, my, notes, my throat's scratchy, and it was a a different type of scratch. It wasn't a cold or a flu type scratchiness. It was just strange. And I'm thinking, geez, I wonder if it was that spray stuff. I mean, I grew up in Boston. We used to run behind the pesticide trucks spraying DDT, right? So I, I, I don't have thin skin. I'm pretty thick skinned about this stuff. But I said, I wonder if it's this spray that they did last night that caused this. And then I started reading about uh, reports from adverse events reported by people in Monterey who were sprayed before us, right around the time when I saw the dead birds. And I said, son of a gun, I wonder if that's the same stuff. You know, they were reporting scratchy eyes, scratchy nose, uh, uh, irritated throat, weird respiratory stuff. And um, then Saturday hit, and um, people walking down Seacliff Beach with their kids and their dogs literally out in the water were birds flapping, not being able to maintain their buoyancy and literally drowning by the droves, not being able to make it to shore because they had this thick coating of yellow-green slime on them, literally drowning in front of your eyes. Usually uh, we went to Native Animal Rescue um, and they say, we've never seen anything like this. In the first two days, we've had 235 birds submitted to us. This has never happened in our 30 years of, of, of wildlife rescue. And the birds were covered with this slime. We got sprayed Thursday night. Friday, we had a little bit of rain. Saturday, we had a torrential downpour. Saturday morning and Sunday morning, the whole coastline was covered with this yellow-green slime which we later found out was the microcaps, which they sprayed because um, people in our coalition, they took water samples, they looked at it under the microscope, San Jose uh, University saw the microcaps, other people took the scrapings off of their windshields, same thing, they saw the microcaps. We talked to uh, people in the neighborhood that had planter boxes, their decks, um, their cars covered with the same green, yellow slime. I'm saying, son of a gun, this is what killed those birds too, likely. I can't say that for sure. But that's what stimulated my uh, interest in this. And from that moment, what I do in the world of herbal medicine is try to help separate the scientific wheat from marketing chaff. Well, I took the same approach to LBAM. Uh, is the moth a real problem, first off? What is the safety of potential toxicity of the stuff they're spraying? And is there a better way? Because what Carol didn't tell you is they planned on doing this three days every month for up to seven years and maybe up to 15 years throughout the entire Bay Area for something they never even looked at the science on. And so that's what fired me up. Oh. That answers your question. Thank you, Roy. Yes. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to introduce Preston Maring and we're going to also talk a little bit about food. Chris uh, is also uh, uh, in, in the food industry. So, Preston Maring, Dr. Preston Maring, is the Associate Physician in Chief at the Kaiser Permanente East Bay Medical Center in Oakland. In 2003, he started a farmer's market at his hospital. And there are now markets at multiple Kaiser Permanente facilities in five states, making healthy food available for many which support Kaiser Permanente's preventative health message in the communities it serves. And so separate from the, the LBAM issue, we're talking about health and children's health, families' health, and even as you mentioned to me, farm workers' health. And so I, I'd like to hear about how you came to this issue. I've been at Kaiser Permanente for 40 years practicing primary care medicine. It's been clear to me that one of the most important determinants for someone's health is what they eat. And what I brought together in 2003 at the all-organic market of my medical center 
It was just a way to put a fresh peach in front of someone in the middle of July or fresh asparagus in spring after it finally sprouted when the ground warmed up in Fresno and figured that perhaps by putting good food in front of people, we can make the switch from eating so many things with O's in it, like Cheetos and Fritos and Doritos, <laughs> and move more toward good, healthy food. Now, our market was an all-organic market at my hospital. I just wanted to keep it that way. But I also recognized that just the step from eating processed foods and packaged foods to a fresh green salad, however it was grown, was the first important step. And then the next step is to take the opportunity when it arises to say, well, you know, if you're going to buy strawberries, you're going to spend a little extra here and there. Maybe you think about the impact of how your food is grown, because really, as you vote with your fork, you're really affecting more than just you, more than just your children and more than just the earth, you're also affecting the people that grow your food. And I took increasing interest in that as I got to know the farmers. And when I got to know about them and I got to know about their children and I got to know about their grandchildren because I had the privilege of having them outside of my hospital, um, I began to get interested in how the choices we make affect them. One of my farmers, uh, I call it my farmer, uh, I, I feel an ownership about the market of my hospital. I mean, there are, as she mentioned, we have 38 markets at Kaiser Permanente facilities around the country. Um, uh, there are markets now at other healthcare systems, Vanderbilt, Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, UCSF, uh, up at Yale, New Haven is uh, getting a market started July 9th. So the concept is spreading. but. You know, when you have a market at your place and you take some ownership for it, you get to know the people. I got a chance to talk to a farmer by the name of Mr. Roberto Rodriguez, who grows strawberries in Watsonville. We had 35 acres of conventional strawberries. Eight years ago, he had a daughter. He did not want his daughter playing in a field where pesticides were used. He started making the transition to organic berries. He now has about half of his acreage in organic strawberries. And in a, a recent uh, season, um, he sold 130 dozen pints of strawberries every week to our institution alone uh, of his organic berries, which allowed him to hire five new farm workers. Now, that's, and I asked him, I said, well, if you've got 16 acres of organic berries, what about all 35? And he said, there is not enough demand yet for all 35 of my acres to be organic. I have to keep half of it in conventional berries so that I can keep my farm workers busy for the whole, you know, seven days a week, which is what they want to be. His farm workers want to be busy. We have the chance to create a future every time we pick up our fork to have all 35 acres of Roberto Rodriguez's strawberries be grown in a way that's not only good for us, but it's also good for his farm workers and the children of the farm workers who are impacted by the pesticides and things that get used on their products. So I come at this, this issue tonight from a much more broad sense and, um, and have learned that what happens with Alabama has a direct impact on individual farmers, and we'll hear more about that from um, my colleague here, uh, and that ultimately uh, affects the downstream supply for institutions like ours and for individuals and other healthcare institutions around that are really increasing their use of sustainable ag. Thank you, Preston. Now, I love the vote with your vote with our fork. Uh, Michael Pollan just came out with a new book, and I heard last night that that one of his ideas, or one of the things he tells people to do, is don't buy any, don't eat anything that comes through your car window. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of one of his rules, his practical rules: don't eat anything coming through your car window. I'd like to introduce Chris Middlestat. 
And Chris is the founder and CEO of The Fruit Guys, the industry leader in providing farm fresh produce, produce to the American workplace. Bringing healthy brain food to the office can boost productivity, improve wellness, and help companies improve their bottom line. What started out as a two-person operation and an old Honda filled with fruit has become a multi-million dollar enterprise that supports many small farmers and employs over 30 staff. Chris is the co-founder of the steering committee for Shape Up San Francisco, Mayor Gavin Newsom's initiative to help San Franciscans move more and eat healthier. Chris is also a former chair and an active member of the Worksite Wellness Committee for the California Task Force on Youth and Workplace Wellness. So part of, part of what Chris does, he's this beautiful person that sits in the middle between farmers and what's happening here and people eating that produce and works in, in, in tandem there and then speaks out for all of those people as well. So Chris, how is it that you came to this issue? Did, did you come to the f issue first? Did Fruit Guys come for, how how did you arrive here? Um, we, we heard about this issue when it uh, first came up a little bit from, from some of our farmers. I also live in San Francisco, so we're aware of it because, you know, I have three kids here and I live in the city and I, I was not interested in being sprayed as well. Um, and, um, but, but it really hit home for me last year. We, we, had, we had been involved, but, um, but it, really, it really came home for me when a farmer of ours up in Aptos, California, so um, near Santa Cruz, um, he's a young guy, uh, his name's Greg, and he has a farm called Blue Moon Organics. And um, he's got up there, he's got seven and a half acres of organic strawberries. And we buy his berries, we buy some of his vegetables, and we put them in our mixes, um, whether they're for companies or, or for, um, for individuals. And um, last year, in about June of 2009, Greg had a, a CDFA inspector come on site and they found a caterpillar, um, a couple of caterpillars, in about three and a half acres of his seven acre um, uh, strawberry fields there. And although they couldn't immediately classify it as a light brown apple moth, because the, the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Ag, has a policy right now that if they have um, any inkling that this may be a light brown apple moth, they immediately quarantine the farm. Greg was shut down for his three and a half, that part of his farm was shut down. Now, you have to remember, this is a small farmer with a very small amount of land. And for somebody uh, to lose half of their ag production, even for you know, a couple of days or weeks, uh, can really impact whether or not they can be a sustainable farm from an economic standpoint. So they told him that, okay, it's gonna take 10 days to identify this caterpillar, we'll get back to you, and then we'll let you know whether you can release your product or not. Turns out it took three and a half, almost four weeks until they were able to identify this. They came back to him and they said, well, actually, you know, this isn't light brown apple moth. But while we were here telling you this, we found in your other three and a half acres, we found some more caterpillars. And this time there's more of them. There's about a hundred of them in this other half of your acreage. And um, Greg said, well, you know, doesn't it make sense that you just found and identified a caterpillar that's not light brown apple moth, yet and, and it looks like the same caterpillar to me, you know, and now it's in the other half of my, my field. Wouldn't it make sense that it's the same caterpillar? So, you know, we can't do it that way. We have to quarantine your farm again, and we're going to, to uh, close it down, and, and we'll get back to you in 10 days. Of course, another three and a half weeks went by, and now they're into August. So, Greg, you know, if, if you know about strawberry production in Santa Cruz, July is it. That's when you're getting your best strawberries, and you're getting good price, and you've got great volume. So... Greg was in effect shut down and, and uh, lost probably when you add it all up about forty to fifty thousand dollars worth of revenue, which for a small farm is is it that's everything. And the challenge for me is not just hearing about Greg's story, but because I'm in the produce industry and I have a wide view on the way produce is bought and sold in the United States and especially in California. Um, I see, for example, apples coming from New Zealand that are imported into the United States. Um, and those farmers in New Zealand have light brown apple moth flying through their orchards every day. Um, in New Zealand, they do not quarantine for the light brown apple moth. What they do instead is you bring your crop to the, uh, the, the point where it's going to be inspected. It's inspected and then shipped to the United States. As long as it goes through the proper inspection process and has a form that enters, in, enters it into the United States, there's no problem. So when I did some research on this, I realized that 
if you ship a container that contains about 86,000 apples, so it's about you know, 18 to 20 pallets, 49 cases on a pallet, you know, 88 to 100 apples per case, um, they only have to inspect, per my reading of the documentation that they've put online, you, they only have to inspect about 300 individual apples in that entire load. And my argument with this is, why are New Zealand apples allowed to be shipped into the United States really without the threat of quarantine, where we have domestic farmers that are quarantined every day because of the threat of light brown apple moth in this area? And to sort of further paint you know, my, my own concern and frustration with this, it's really our tax dollars, right, as citizens of the United States that are funding an agency that is working against our domestic producers of local and sustainable ag and giving benefit to international farmers. To me, that is wrong. And, and I find it highly concerning and something that needs to be addressed. So that Thank is you. how I got involved. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the chemicals and the inert ingredients, and Caroline and Roy, I know you both have a lot of information on that, so can we just talk a little bit about those chemicals, if you could? Sure. So for me, um, the chemicals that are proposed for use in the apple moth program, uh, the most important thing about it is really what we don't know about them, rather than what we do know about them. So for those of you who are familiar with pesticides, you've probably heard that um, well, you can't use them unless um, the U.S. EPA says they're okay. Um, and they're tested more than any other chemical. Well, um, let's just look at the, um, the pheromone that was um, the central chemical in the 2007 spring and will continue to be used in, in the future plans for this program. Um, actually, um, EPA uh, when they looked at the pheromones, um, waived all of the health and safety tests on this chemical. And they said, well, this is, a, this is a, a mating pheromone, so we don't have any reason to expect that it would cause any problem, so we're going to waive all the tests. And there's kind of a catch-22 there, right? I mean, actually, pheromones are sort of a third-generation pesticide and supposed to not have the problems that some of the earlier chemicals did. However, if you don't test them, you're never going to know that for sure, right? The other issue is um, what are misleadingly called the inert ingredients um, in pesticides. So probably many of you know that most of the ingredients in a pesticide product are um, actually not publicly identified. Um, some of you may know that um, most of those unidentified chemicals are not included in most of the testing that's done on a pesticide. So um, when Roy and his neighbors were sprayed in Santa Cruz, um, they didn't actually know what they were sprayed with. Um, and neither was there any official health and safety data to tell them what the effects of being exposed to that mixture of chemicals um, might be. So we're in a situation where we just don't know very much. And so when you propose to take a chemical with all these unknowns and spray it on, you know, 10 million people, whatever, um, alarm bells start to go off. Um, and um, there's, you know, something that doesn't quite seem right. Roy, comment on that too, but also I know you were involved in, in the trying to reclassify this. So if you could speak to both the chemicals and also the reclassification effort you were leading. Sure. Um, we looked at the, uh, actually, interestingly, the uh, ingredients of Checkmate, which was sprayed, were accidentally released in the Santa Cruz Sentinel just by, just by, by accident, literally by accident, because it was supposed to be proprietary information. And that's how we found out about what was in it. Uh, one of the compounds, uh, tricapital methyl ammonium chloride, is so toxic that you're not even supposed to have any residues on conventional foods, let alone organic produce, and this stuff was, uh, was approved um, for application to organic produce so that it wouldn't hurt the organic farmers, interestingly. Um, the biggest thing on the safety side, from my perspective, is uh, to continue what Carol was saying, is that because EPA gave it a waiver, they exempted it from any safety testing whatsoever. Uh, then it came to OEHAR, our 
Department of Health here in, in California and to the Department of Pesticide Regulation, both of whom said EPA has given it a clear, clean seal of approval, therefore it's safe. You see the catch-22 there? They exempted the product from safety testing, therefore the state health people said EPA says it is safe, no problem, we can spray this all over our babies, our old people, our children, our infirm, and we're going to do this every month for seven years. Um, there was no safety assessment on this whatsoever before this was sprayed and before it was planned to be sprayed almost throughout the entire state of California because Alabama lives from Sonoma and has been found down as far down as uh, San Diego now, LA and San Diego. Um, that's the entire state of California almost. Um, and then when you look at some of the other uh, compounds, um, actually a big part of the, the encapsulation was made up of urea, which is uric acid, which is like pee. Um, but when that goes into seawater, that acts as an agent that can feed plankton that gives rise to red tide. After the spray, we had the worst red tide in the history of Santa Cruz in 25 years. To go back to the birds, um, the native plant, uh, native animal rescue people said that with the worst red tide, they get maybe 25 uh, birds submitted to them that were hurt by red tide. This was 230 in three days, and by about uh, week four or five, uh, we had more than 700 dead birds, not injured birds, dead birds reported and found. Uh, when you look at the scientific literature and you say, when you have a fallout like this, you only find 10% of what was harmed. So that means there were more like 7,000 birds that were killed. Um, what we also saw are not just the seabirds, but um, a gentleman lived at uh, Pleasure, uh, Pleasure Point for 30 years, and oh, he was a birder. He loved to watch the songbirds. He said after the, the week after the spray, there were no songbirds in his yard. And then at about day eight, he was uh, walking his dog around the neighborhood and just seeing all these dead land birds. A uh, woman down in Monterey uh, was raising pygmy rabbits. If you know anything about pygmy rabbits, they're actually used to detect uh, biochemical warfare uh, because they're very sensitive respiratory-wise. She's been doing this for 15 or 18 years, never lost a litter. The day after, almost lost her entire litter. The week later, uh, another one of her... her um, um, females uh, miscarried, and that had never happened in 15 years. Uh, people with fish ponds, Jeff Hafferman, he's a councilman down in Monterey, his wife has a fish pond. Day after the spray, covered with a film of this yellow-green stuff, the next day all of her fish were dead. Somebody else a dead goat. I had a, work, a work, uh, uh, working partner who uh, had three cats one of his cats got out during the spray and was covered with this spray and spent the next two or three days. They tried to towel him off, but the cat spent the next two or three days just constantly licking and licking, and third day he was dead. The other two cats that weren't exposed were fine. So this is just one after another of these safe pesticides. To get to um, the thing that drives programs like this is that a bug's name is on a list light brown apple moth. This is on a USDA hit list. It says, if this comes into the country, then we have to go into action mode to try to eradicate it to, to get it out of, uh, out of the state or out of the country. And that's what they did. Um, but when we went to New Zealand and talked to ag people there and Australia and Hawaii and in the United Kingdom, all of where Elbam has been naturalized. Elbam has been in Hawaii for 114 years. And they're saying, why are you asking us about Elbam, this nothing moth? The ag people are telling us this is going to destroy the precious redwoods and the cypresses and the oaks. And we go to the, the, the um, forestry ag, uh, the commissioner of forestry in New Zealand, and he says, El what? L what? Light, light brown what? And it took them three hours to find somebody who knew what light brown apple moth was, and they had never heard of it affecting anything in native flora at all. Hawaii, the same thing. Yannick uh, went out and called uh, wineries in New Zealand, Australia, Hawaii. Uh, same thing. Why are you asking us about this nothing insect? 
And so this is where we started the reclassification, reclassification process where we looked at all the scientific literature for more than 100 years, uh, published in the ag journals all over the world. We talked to ag officials all over the world where LBAM was uh, naturalized or native, and the consensus was this is easily managed in agricultural systems. Most of the things we use uh, to control other more important pests also work for LBAM, and in most cases, and especially in organic systems, they hardly ever have to treat because natural predation uh, is what keeps it at bay naturally without using any pesticide whatsoever. And let me just say one other thing is that light brown apple moth is a superficial leaf roller. You've all seen it. You go into your rose bushes and you see a leaf that's kind of folded in half and there's webbing in it. But it does nothing to the plant, to the actual health of the plant. It just rolls it, then it flits away, becomes part of the food chain. They're the moths that we see flitting around our, our, our porch lights every night that do nothing to anything. They're just background insects. So that's what this is. But because it was classified in the way that it was, they felt that they needed to eradicate it from the state. And to do that, they're going to put our health at jeopardy. So moving into also talking about the farmers. And Chris, I, uh, this brings up a point, too, about so two years later, are farmers What's happening to our farmers? Are they afraid? Are they, can they speak out? Can they, um, are, do, are they feeling better about this? Are they still under big threat? Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think part of it is, is, you know, farmers are generally so busy farming and doing their jobs every day that they're not, they're not often paying attention at, at a deep level. And I think they don't really understand the impact sometimes until it hits them. And I mean, that's, that's been my personal experience with many of the farmers I've talked to, because I had the same experience that Roy did, which is, you know, hey, like brown apple moth, if you heard of this, is this a problem? And they're like, what are you talking about? If we're going to spray for anything, spray for codling moth, because that actually eats my fruit. Like brown apple moth doesn't do anything. And um, the, so the farmers, I think, that, that we've worked with have only become aware of it then when they're, they all of a sudden the quarantine area begins to expand and they start talking to other farmers that may have been quarantined and they hear, well, wait a minute, do you, quarantine means that if they find even one moth on my property, I can't sell my product that's harvested or, you know, I'm going to have a very difficult, you know, uh, time in actually being sort of economically viable here. And that's when they start to take notice and that's, that's, we're seeing more and more awareness now. Um, and, you know, I, I'm concerned that this is kind of part of a, you know, a broad, um, and, and I don't think it's premeditated at all because that would be, a, you know, a theory that I just don't subscribe to, but I think it's an accidental sort of um, long-term uh, creation of hindrances to sustainable agriculture in general that I think we have to be aware of and recognize and be very careful about, whether it's, you know, new regulations that may come out from the FDA around um, sort of uh, bringing small and local sustainable farms up to a level of um, uh, food safety that's going to have to mirror sort of commercial agriculture, which is going to create huge capital intensive challenges for small farms, or whether it's light brown apple moth that's creating huge economic hindrances for small farmers just to do things in an organic and sustainable way. These are things that when you add them all up together and you take a look at the trend, it's going to force sustainable and small local agriculture into a box that they're not able to get out of. And that's that's where I see somebody like Preston over at, you know, Kaiser. And when, when Preston and I met re originally, he was, you know, continuing thinking about how do you solve this problem of bringing small, sustainable, and local organic farmers to people so that people can, you know, take part in that and, and bolster that economic movement as well. And um, I, I just don't want these legal or structural or, you know, uh, quarantine things that, that end up hindering these farmers from, from taking hold. So. Yeah. Uh, Preston, and, and that dovetails nicely to you because in terms of the farmers, your farmers, and your patients in your hospital, that are you seeing, what kinds of partnerships are you seeing arise there? Are, are, you, are, are you hearing new things? Are, farmer, are more farmers saying things to you? Are, are patients saying things to you? Are they glad that they have this, this opening for this kind of produce? Or, just the kinds of things that you're hearing from, from now all 38, is it? 38 markets. 
Well, as I, as I said before, good food is the foundation of preventive health. And preventive health is what uh, I, I think the future of healthcare needs to be. And it's certainly the kind of work that goes on in, in my healthcare system. Um, and good food is not just food that has certain micronutrients, uh, so much lycopene and so much omega-3s and all this. And I, I personally, uh, while all that's very important, um, I look more just at the, the, the general principles. If you're going to have good food that goes beyond the micronutrients, it's got to be good for you, it's got to be good for your kids, it's got to be sustainable in terms of how it's grown as far as the earth is concerned, but it's also best if it's good for the farm workers. There's more and more information available these days on the impacts of organophosphate pesticides used in agriculture on farm workers and their children. Uh, a colleague at the University of California in Berkeley runs a program called Chamacos. It's the comprehensive health assessment of the mothers and children of Salinas. Uh, she and her, uh, Dr. Brenda Eskenazi and her staff uh, are studying now over 600 children uh, some of whom are up to nine years old that are born uh, to farm workers. And she's looked very carefully at the various levels of metabolites of pesticides on the farm workers, on their children, looking back at levels in amniotic fluid and cord blood in the children's urine as they grow, uh, and studying them very carefully for impacts on their health. I'm not going to go into details now, but there are uh, adverse impacts that are statistically significantly related uh, to levels of pesticide exposure in some of these children. And it's not just her studies that show this. There's uh, another university on the other coast doing similar studies that are coming up with the same findings. Uh, UCSF's Center for Reproductive Health put out an excellent white paper last year about the impacts of uh, pesticides and, and other toxics on reproductive health and looked at, uh, you know, miscarriages and fertility and birth defects and also at uh, childhood cancers and looked at all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's an excellent comprehensive study. Uh, and the, the basic summary statement out of all that work, when speaking to practitioners who are involved in reproductive health, is, you know, talk to your patients about what kind of chemicals they're using in their home, what kind of chemicals they're using for their personal hygiene, uh, what kind of chemicals are on the food they eat, because all those things matter. Now, we all in this room of any age are loaded with all kinds of industrial chemicals at this point. I mean, one of my colleagues, uh, a leader in the environmental stewardship at Kaiser Permanente got tested <clears throat> just for a good slide for talking points that makes the point. She had the basic 27 industrial chemicals in her, including DDT. Now, DDT was outlawed in 1972. She still got it in her body. And if she's got it, I've got it. And, you know, two and running behind the trucks in the East Coast. Uh, 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 it's likely present in all of us. I can't say as I sit here that those levels of chemicals in our body are doing specifically something to me, and my die might be cast. I mean, I'm 65. What I'm concerned about are the children, you know, for the future, who are yet to even be conceived, and where, where our efforts, I think, really need to be is at the preconceptional phase, you know, to get through to young women and to young men uh, before pregnancy ever happens. And that's really our prime time for making a difference. A good, healthy diet of organically grown foods, avoidance of substance abuse, uh, the basic premises of, uh, of, of good health at that age will change the future. 
Uh, and, you know, that while we're specifically talking about the light brown apple moth tonight, it's, it's, a, it's a great example of the broader picture and the complexities of the broader picture. And if I could chime in on, on something, a lot of us, I was in a congressional hearing in, uh, I think it was in 1992, and it was a congressional hearing on pesticides because uh, there had just been a study of the you know, of children reaching their maximum uh, allowable amounts of many of these agrochemicals by the age of six. This is in 1992, so this is not a new story. Um, but what really piqued my interest in this congressional hearing was that they said that uh, the majority of the pesticides that were being used were, were not designed to kill bugs. They were designed to... Uh, create a high rate of reproductive failure in the bug population so that they would have miscarriages, so they would have be infertile, and uh, because they're endocrine disruptors. Uh, so a lot of them are estrogen-based, and we wonder why women have one in eight in this country, one in eight rate of breast cancer, men one in eight or one in nine prostate cancer. It's the same mechanism. Um, but why is it that women in rural China is one in 30? Uh, Japan, 1 in 15, 1 in 18, in many Asian countries. And then when they come here and start to eat the foods that we have here, their rate of breast cancer exactly meets the 1 in 8 within a few years. This is not a mystery. It's not in the water, and it's not something that's new news. Um, but but it is a, this is an LBM is a microcosm of the way that USDA, CDFA, and all of our agriculture officials, most of them, not all, but most, um, manage our food supply in a very, very insidious way. Uh, because of the E. coli breakout of spinach, which happened in Santa Cruz a number of years ago, they're moving toward the sterilization of our food supply, trying to get rid of everything that can cause anything when they should be doing the exact opposite and creating a healthy biological system that naturally prevents invasions of pests and pathogens. But this is not what we're doing. Uh, we tend to be overreactive as a, as a country. And as Chris said, I don't think it's malicious, but it is institutionalized ignorance that this is how they've been taught. Uh, they've been taught this in school, not to think biologically, but to think bug, bad, kill not create a healthy environment that will produce a healthy food. And everything that we're doing in the mass market of food production is leading toward human health degradation and environmental health degradation, and it will impact our future generations more than, more than us, because it it's, it's builds up and builds up over generations in time. Mm -hmm. It's not a mystery, and, and we have to do something about this. And, I think voting with our fork is the single best way. And it's kind of interesting in that we're actually, the government is moving toward this sanitization of our food supply, but organics is the number one growing category in the food market mm -hmm. in this country. So there's a, an odd juxtaposition mm -hmm. of, of events going on where our bureaucrats are way, way behind the times, but our consumer base is catching up with reality. We have to do that a little faster. And, and just one second, anybody that would like to ask a question, if you'd line up over here at the microphone, we want to make sure we capture that on the mic. And uh, Preston. Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment about the, the statistics about breast cancer, prostate cancer, and so forth. While the, uh, those incidence rates are in the range of the incidence rates with which I'm familiar also, um, I don't know that we can say, I mean, it's a very... It's a very complex issue, and I don't know that we can imply that it's just related to uh, pesticides in foods. I think there, it's a multifactorial uh, problem. Absolutely. Uh, okay. I, I should also, I, one thing to add as well, that uh, one of the things that's also a, a misconception, I think, sometimes about organics, and I think should be clarified for the public and people should understand this, is that there are organic pesticides that are used. Um, organic farms can put pesticides on their product that are classified as organic pesticides. And I think that, you know, one of the things I'm personally interested in and the reason I think, you know, at, at Fruit Guys and myself personally, we want to have more of a personal relationship with farmers is because we actually want to know exactly what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, rather than taking it for granted that, you know, this is something that's 
quote unquote organic. And I think that's part of this problem too with light brown apple moth or any of these issues is that you know the definition of what it really is versus how it's um, classified or what it's what it says it is. You, you have to kind of understand that difference a little bit. Mm -hmm.